Hey, 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 welcome to another video from CardboardEast.com. My name's Jay, and today we're going to talk about the best Royal and Wright games from Asia. Now, this is going to be our first top 10 video. I know Asia is known for its smaller board games, and that's just because of the culture here. But today I want to do something a little bit more differently. I didn't want to pick 10 games and just talk about them, and all you do is see my face. So I'm going to compare the games, open them up, show them to you and kind of discuss to you why I ranked them in the order that I did. Now, I do want to do an honorable mention here and that's this game. Uh, I've already written a review of this game. You can find it on CardboardEats.com and I believe it's also on BGG. This is uh, Psychic Pizza Delivers Go to the Ghost Town. That's often just abbreviated to Psychic Pizza. In this game you are these pizza delivery boys, girls, and you're going to the ghost town to deliver pizza. However, you've lost your pizza and you need to find your pizza and then deliver it. And it's called Psychic Pizza Deliverers because you have psychic powers. This is not a roll and write game. This is more of a deduction game, but you still use pen and paper. You're still writing down the clues. You're looking to know what's north, south, east and west, east and west of you. And you're trying to deduce uh, where you are on this tiny little map. This is a great, great game, and if you can find it on Amazon.jp, uh, grab it, because I think it's definitely going to be one that's going to stand the test of time. It's essentially just a watered-down version of D&D. &D. I can't get enough of this game. Highly recommend it. Coming in at number 10 and number 9 are Madrino by Nanawari and Geometric Art from Emperor S4. Now, Madrino from Nanawari is about architects. And everyone's going to be rolling dice and you're going to be designing the floor plan of an apartment. Which is really unique because I've never seen that before in a game. I've seen lots of crazy apartments where there's a bed next to the, <laughs> next to the sink. There's a bed next to the bathtub. The bathtub is in the middle of the bedroom. There are holes in the walls. And it's really interesting and I've never seen a game tackle this particular subject before. So I definitely wanted to highlight this game. This, however, is number 10. And the reason why is because at the end of the game, there's no scoring. You just show your floor plan to everybody and say, oh, what do you think? Do you think it's the best? And that just never really felt right to me. So this feels a little bit underdeveloped in that sense. I've been tempted to go through it and try to make my own scoring variant, but I've been a little bit busy. Coming in number nine is Geometric Art from Emperor S4 Games. Now, I do have a really good working relationship with Emperor S4 Games. I do a lot of uh, proofreading for their English rules. In fact, I believe I did the English proofreading for, for this particular game. And Geometric Art is basically uh, Pictionary, the, the dice game. And what I love about this, though, is that the art that you draw is here. And you get to see, it looks like people are watching your art. And then you get to write the name here. This is, while very cool, it's a little bit unfortunate that your drawing space is so limited and so small. That's a big problem that I had with the design. The biggest art problem that I have with geometric art is that while the rule book is very clear and specific, it just feels a lot more complicated than it needs to be, especially for this simple game. Also, there are several different play styles in this game. And I've never really liked that. It felt like this is more of like a sandbox and the players can kind of do what they want. There's a cooperative, there's competitive mode. So I feel that in a way this is a little bit overdeveloped in that sense. So I feel that this is a little bit overdeveloped, this is a little bit underdeveloped. I am going to lean a little bit more towards this one. Um, just because it's a lot more fun, a little bit more dynamic. Uh, the dice have all these cool little shapes. And so sometimes you end up drawing the exact same picture than the other person, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but again, this feels a little bit overdeveloped, this feels a little bit underdeveloped, but it's so incredibly unique, so I have to put this on my number 10. All right, moving on. Number eight, Katsudoku, Roll for Kyoto. And number six, uh, Tyrannosaurus's Holiday. We're gonna skip number seven, and then we'll come back to number seven in just a little bit. But these are the two cat games. So if you're looking for cats and rolling rights, these are the two games to get. This is the first edition of the game, and it's a little bit messy here. The name is Tyrannosaurus's Holiday because the producer, uh, Wang Yu, his cat's name is T-Rex or Tyrannosaurus. I believe the second edition, they changed it to T-Rex's Holiday, T-Rex apostrophe S Holiday because 
people couldn't spell Tyrannosaurus and couldn't find it on BGG, <laughs> which is just kind of sad in many ways. Anyway, looking at these two, if you're gonna buy a game just for cuteness factor of the box, I think Cat Sudoku will win out this entire list. Look at this, this is just cute, cute, cute. But I think T-Rex's Holiday is a better game than Cat Sudoku. And so for me to go into the why, we're gonna open up both games and talk about why. So we're gonna look at Cat Sudoku here and it comes with dice. And this is, doesn't come with the game, but this is my first player marker. Cool cat meeple. And here you can see that Cat Sudoku comes with four different player sheets. Uh, one for each season, spring to winter. They get progressively harder and harder. And while you can see the cute cats here, eventually through the course of the game, the cat is going to be covered with numbers all over his body like a Yakuza cat filled with tattoos. Now the gameplay is very simple. You're just going to roll dice and you have to fill out this grid uh, following the rules of Sudoku, meaning that like 1 through 10 here, 1 through 10 here, and then you'll lose points uh, for breaking those rules. This has the benefit of playing uh, solo and multiplayer. This is one of those games where you can play 1 to 99 if you have 99 friends to play with. Now, T-Rex's Holiday, the box is, looks like a package just got delivered to your home and you can't scratch it up. And it's T-Rex's Holiday or Tyrannosaurus Rose's Holiday is very confusing. Like, I don't know what it is. Is there, is there a holiday? Is there a dinosaur? Why is a dinosaur on holiday? Do dinosaurs go fishing on holidays? I don't understand. Why is there a cat here? But if you open it up, well, first you get really cool dice, as opposed to the regular dice you get in Cat Sudoku. But if you look at the player aid, or the player sheet, this is far cuter than what you get here. Now, this is just, you know, <laughs> uh, kind, of, kind of shallow, saying like, oh, this is a prettier game. But if you got the game for cats, then this, I think, is the better game because you get to appreciate the cat art more often. This does not play solo. This does play solo. However, the main mechanic of the game is that you'll roll the dice, or should I say, You'll use your hand to cover, you'll roll the dice, and then you'll pick one to hide. Everyone uses these numbers first, and then you reveal this number. And this little twist makes this cute game absolutely mean. Sometimes you have to do a straight, going from ascending to descending, or uh, smaller to bigger numbers, and then you'll just throw a six or a one there, and you'll see the anguish on other people's faces going, why did you do that? And the game just gets harder and harder and harder, and you're gonna be forced to make more and more uncomfortable, bad decisions uh, as you play. And I find that this is a lot more interactive and a lot more fun. This is just multiplayer solitaire, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I prefer play interaction in my games, and this has a lot more of it, and it has a cuter pad. Unfortunately, there's only one, and this has four. But that's why T-Rex Holiday is my number six, and Cat Sudoku is my number eight. Moving on. Number five is Yokohama Roll and Write. Uh, Yokohama Roll and Write just came out, and I gotta say that I still like Yokohama Duel, but Yokohama Roll and Write is much, much better. And it's my number five because it plays far differently than any other Roll and Ride I've ever played. It's very, very, very unique. The one problem that I have with uh, this is that once you get all the cards and all the little placements for your dice areas, it takes up a lot of table space. It's pretty much a beast. And it feels kind of more like an actual board game than it does just a simple condensed Roll and Ride. Yokohama Roll and Write does come with an optional rule for this start player token where the start player chooses to die and then no one else can choose that. I recommend playing with this because it makes the game far more interactive. And again, like before I said, I prefer interaction with, uh, with games. And they definitely give you enough cards, so there is definitely more replay value here. Uh, this, I believe, is also available on Amazon.jp, uh, so if you can grab a hand it's on a copy. I definitely would recommend it. But don't worry about the Japanese though that's on the cards. Uh, someone has translated it. Not someone. 
the artist, the artist of the game, who has done the art for all the Yokohama, I believe, uh, posted it on BGG, so everything is translated and playable there. And this has been my number five, Yokohama Roll and Write. Moving on. Now, uh, for those of you who can remember, we skipped number seven. And so now we are up to number four and number seven. This is number seven. This is number four. Now, they're both the same game. Let's make a bus route. Let's make a bus route. The dice game. Some of the reviews that have been coming out have been, still been favoring the original. I really prefer the dice game more. And in order to uh, understand why, we're going to crack open both games and then I can show you some of the components. First, let's talk about the box. This one is like a standard A4 size and it's really skinny. Uh, not many games uh, are this shape. I think this is like one of three in my collection that actually is shaped like this. It can fit into a backpack just fine. Um, but it just feels odd in the collection. Whereas this one is small enough it can fit inside, you know, like a pretty big purse or a nice comfortable backpack. I don't know, this one just to me just feels a lot more portable. But moving past that, um, if you look at the box itself, this one here has, the insert here has ridges on the middle and on the sides. Where if you look on this one, the insert only has these little ridges on the bottom and the middle, none on the top. Unfortunately, what that means is that the map is constantly going to seesaw like this and it will eventually do a little bit of warping here. You can't really see, it's very subtle. But moving on, let's talk about the maps here. Uh, Roll Right the Dice Game comes with two maps. Uh, this one only comes with one, exact same on both sides. So, I mean, this one you get a little bit more variety in the gameplay, and this one, uh, not so much. Also, for this, uh, maybe it's just because it's smaller, it just feels a lot more sturdier. Whereas this one feels a little bit more flimsy and malleable, like I could, I could bend it. And while that is cool, I guess, it's not something I'm particularly crazy about. Uh, now, let's look at the player sheets. Now, if you look here, like my copy is slightly warped. I guess you can't really tell. Maybe if I tick out all of them, you'll see more. These are slightly warped. And I'm not a big fan of that. I think it's just because of the material. Uh, maybe it's just the humidity. I do live on an island. Now, just by looking at the player, <laughs> the player sheets, or the player boards, should I say, uh, you can definitely tell that the dice game has a lot more going on. There's different kinds of traffic violations. This one only has really one. You know, this one has the powers that you can combo up. This one has none. Now, the original one can play uh, multiplayer from one to four, I believe, and this is only strictly so solo or uh, two. Or should I say solo or two. I found that when this one was released, it was very, very innovative. Nothing was quite like it. You get to, everyone is drawing on the map, they're sharing the same space, and you're kind of fighting for where the buses go. Really interesting, very different. This, I think, um, expands on that, but condenses it down to two players. And I really, really like the dice mechanic. I love that the dice in this game, they don't follow the Yahtzee rules. Because I think that a lot of Roland Wright games are like, oh, let's just have Yahtzee, you roll three times, and you, you can mitigate the randomness that way. I, no, I don't. I like this, it's just you roll it, that's what you get. Um, some people complain that this is a little bit long for 12 rounds, but I mean, that's, that's how long this one was. So I don't really see the difference. I think they both felt about the same. Uh, this one is a far more rewarding uh, solo variant and, than this one. And while this one can play more people at the table, I think this overall is a better gaming experience. In addition, like this one comes on the backs of the cover with a nice little felt there. So you get a nice little dice tray here. And we'll talk more about this in just a second. But for me, all these little touches here make this uh, a better game. And I think it should be because it came out later. So Sashi spent more time on this and developed it a little bit more. And so that's why, let's make a bus route, 
is my number seven. And let's make a bus route. The dice game is my number four. Moving on. Number three is Walk and Roll by David Chow, Singaporean designer. Now, this box is, well, it's not, <laughs> it's not very pretty. I think it looks really cool. I like the white and the red, but it's not very inviting for players. It doesn't have that, uh, I guess, wow factor. It's definitely a little bit more classy. Uh, now, why do I like this more than Let's Make a Bus Route the Dice Game? Well, let's crack them open inside and then see what we have inside. Now, I did mention before that we'll talk again about Let's Make a Bus Route the Dice Game, the inside felt, uh, why I think they put this in. I believe this game came out first. I guess walk and roll came out first. And you see the dice, this little inside walk here is kind of cool, it comes like its own little dice tray. But if you listen very carefully, it's kind of noisy. And while this doesn't seem like that obnoxious on the video, well, as you play the game over and over again, and this follows the Yahtzee rules of just roll three times, roll three times, it can kind of get grating a little bit. And I think that's why when Sashi and Sashi did his, he opted for the nice, quiet felt. Now, do these <laughs> designers talk to each other? How do they know that he was doing this and he was doing this? Um, they do definitely talk to each other. And in case you didn't know, like they both designed a game together last year, uh, Remember Our Trip, designed by Sashi and Sashi and Daryl Cha. But why? Why do I like Walk and Roll more than Let's make a bus route the dice game. Well, there's a lot of similarities between these two, and I think it's because the designers are friends. First, let's just look at the inside. Like, these player boards are, one, double-sided. And it's, I apologize for the gloss here, but look how gorgeous, like, these are. They're so bright, they're so colorful. Ooh, a little sticky here. And they're double-sided. These player boards are double sided, not just for solo play and multiplayer. This has like the basic game with not too many complicated rules, so it's a little bit more approachable. And then they have the <laughs> advanced level where there are just a far more options for you to play with and a far more combos for you to unlock and play with. In addition to that, there are lots of little modular expansions that you could play with and toss in to the game. And I think this uh, modularity makes this a little bit better. Now, uh, I still love this game. I adore this game. This is a great game. But it's very unique and it doesn't uh, necessarily feel like uh, different rolling rights. And that's definitely a bonus, in my opinion. However, if you're looking for something that feels a little bit more like, I guess, like quicks or the, that standard style of roll three times, choose the best one, find these little combinations. And I think walk and roll is probably what you're looking for. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely love about this is that when you, when you roll the dice, uh, some dice are for you and then some dice uh, are for everybody. So you get to, there's this great little player interaction where the other players are chanting at you. It's like, no, 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 I want chicken. I want chicken, I want chicken. And you're like, no, no chicken in this kitchen. Uh, rock and Roll has you as different restaurant tours, and you're making dishes in your restaurant. And these are actual dishes that you can find in the restaurant. And I love the fact that they kept the actual Chinese name uh, of those dishes on the player boards. That is really cool. It comes with different little solo rules. The solo rules are okay, but you don't get that interaction uh, with the dice. The interaction that you have with the dice makes this a real, real winner. And I think this might be my favorite game from Origami. That's the name of the publisher, of Daryl Child's publisher. This might be, I think, my favorite game that they have done. But this is Rock and Roll, and that's why Rock and Roll is my number three. Uh, <laughs> on a side note, is that when you look online, you look at people play, you get to name your restaurant. I mean, you get to name your bus and so, or whatever and some of the other games, but I guess Chinese restaurants, especially in America, they're just known for the terrible puns. Like, this is called walk and roll. I mean, come on. The, I believe the, the Chinese restaurant uh, at my college was called, like, walk and, walk and go. And there's another one called walk and stop. I mean, where does it all end? <laughs> you can find this at Origami's uh, webpage. 
and they can deliver it to you. Now, whether or not you think the shipping is worth it is a question that only you, you can answer. I think this is a fantastic game, easily one of the best rolling rights I've ever played. You should definitely seek this out. This is my number three. Moving on. So, before we get to number two, I want to talk to you about my number four and number three just a little bit more. What I like about these games is that they are very simple in nature, but there's a lot going on in these games. Um, one of the things I do have to say, though, is that while this game is very simple, um, this rule book is, what, 32 pages long? I do appreciate the granular detail of the rules and how thorough they are. Uh, these are the Japanese, don't worry, it, there is also English inside. I do appreciate how detailed it is, but I feel that they kind of went overboard with this. Like, this game is so simple, I don't think you needed 32 pages of rules to really get you into the game. Whereas Walk and Roll, Walk, Walk and, oh, I just want to say Walk and Roll. Walk and Roll, the rules are actually, you know, what, six, seven? Eight, nine, ten, sorry, oh, I know, I'm not a big fan of, of this newspaper style, but they're only, what, nine pages long, so you can get into the game a lot faster uh, with this one. Nine pages as opposed to 32. Uh, both of these games do have a lot going on, and I love that there are these com combos that you can kind of build up and use, and lots of fun little choices that you can have, but something about the simplicity of Metro X I think just beats out both of them. Now, I love complexity in my games, but the simplicity of Metro X, I think, just really, really sings. And I love how simple the game is. Uh, this game is by Hisashi Yashi. It is available in North America. Oh, cool. Here's my uh, cool little Tokyo subway uh, car, just for fun. Uh, this technically is under a roll and write. This is a flip and write. We have a deck of cards. but. I I just, all right, rant in three, two, one. I'm sweaty, I'm sweaty, I'm so angry. All right, all right. Oh. Sorry, our AC uh, has to be turned off while we film, so it gets a little bit hot here, and it is the summer. But you were promised to rant, and here it is. I don't understand why some people are like, it's a flipping right, it's not a rolling right, there are different things. I, I just don't get you, man. I really don't. Because this, essentially, could be just a D20. Right? You roll it, or you just draw a card. Oh, here you go. Now it's a D19. D18, D17, D16, D13. Like, that's the exact same as a dice game, in my opinion. I feel that these actually offer a little bit more design space for designers because if you wanted to change the game you could just change the deck of cards and then you completely changed uh, the dice and very cheaply might I add. So I think that saying that flipper rights aren't real roller rights is kind of just kind of childish. You should stop it. Stop it. Back up tough. The simplicity of this game makes it sing for me and I love that it's so approachable that you could teach this game in just a few minutes and then you can get one to 99 of your friends or 100 of your friends, if you have enough sheets, that is, uh, to play this game. Uh, this game is also available in North America, as I mentioned before. However, they made this paper into, what's the, what's the word? <laughs> Dry eraser boards that you could erase and just use markers on. This one stuck with pencils and paper. Um, I kind of like the nice um, tactile feel of this a little bit more. Uh, what's also cool is that this one comes with uh, two maps, Tokyo and Osaka, and there's also an expansion for it. No, not Cyclades Monuments. I kind of threw my box away. But there are all these other uh, maps that are available for it. Like you have Sendai, you have Nagoya, and then you have like, oh, this is Tokyo, which just comes from here. But there are lots of other maps. And in fact, if you go to BGG, oh, Nakata, there's just a lot of maps um, for Metro X. If you go to BGG, BGG users has even, have even made other subways of other cities, uh, not just in Japan. So there's a lot of replay value and places to explore uh, within Metro X and this simple system. Um, I really hope that Hisashi Yashi uh, builds more of these maps and just adds more and more life to the game. Um, I can't recommend this game enough. 
It is so good that it was brought to America. That's how good it was because people just fell in love with it. Uh, and this has been my number two, Metro X. Before we get to the number one, let's just do a quick recap here. Psychic Pizza is my honorable mention. Number 10, Madrino. Number nine, Geometric Art. Number eight, Katsudoku. Number seven, Ooh. <laughs> let's make a bus route. Number six, T-Rex's Holiday. <laughs> Number five, Yokohama Roll and Write. Number four, let's make a bus route, the dice game. Number three, walk and roll. Number two, Metro X. So what do I think is the best roll and write game from Asia? Natsu Memo or Shuja Ji. <laughs> I think this is by far the best roll and write game, not just in Asia, that I've ever played. This is my favorite roll and write game ever. This will probably never go to North America or to Europe, unfortunately. But why? Why is it my favorite game? Well, this, um, fortunately or unfortunately, plays a lot more like a party game than it does, uh, let's say, like Metro X or Walk and Roll or Let's Make a Bus Route. Uh, this can't be played solo um, and really can't really be played with two. There is a two player variant on BGG and you can look it up. But this plays birds! <laughs> Well, this plays best, uh, not even with three. I would say this plays best with four or five or six players. That's a moat comes with two player sheets. One, you actually keep hidden underneath. And if you look closely, this is a month. In the game, you're all junior high school students. It is the last month of summer, and you are planning out what you're going to do with all your friends. And there are four rounds in the game, uh, one for each week. And there are fun activities that you do. I like can go on a barbecue, you got video game day, you can go visit grandma, uh, go to the beach, or you can go to Tokyo, or you can, uh, you have like a slumber party. There are lots of fun little activities that you can do and you have to plan them all out. Unfortunately, you also have, let's see here, 25 pages of homework to do. And for each page you don't do, you lose 10 points and that's a lot of points in the game that's incredibly punishing so you have to work your way through and try to get up to 30 or up to 25. Natsu Memo is a roll and write it is a flip and write so essentially what you're going to do is you're going to flip over one of these cards and it's going to be an activity and you're going to tell people like hey who wants to come with me on this activity three two one and then you raise your hand and then everyone who gets to go on this activity uh, you'll plan out when you're going to go and you get to give hearts to other people on uh, that come accompanying you on the trip. And this is kind of like you building your friendship over that last amount of summer. And this will also give you points. And it's kind of funny at the end of the game, we're like, what? I gave you all this love and you gave me nothing in return. You spent all your love on Sandra. Why Sandra? And it creates this fun, hilarious, uh, atmosphere at the table and all the activities range from stuff and you have like diff week one, week two, week three, week four and they all uh, vary like sometimes you go into the amusement park you have a slumber party you're just going shopping with some friends you're studying you're going to Tokyo for like 24 massive points hanging out building a fort like these are just fun little activities that you do with your friends and I think this makes it really fun and playful. Uh, you also get a cute little eraser. Now, this is the uh, mainland China version. Um, I have uh, two other friends who have this copy and they all got different cute little racers. Like I got a little fish, uh, my other friend got a zebra, and I think the other one got like a dinosaur. Like that's really cool. Now the pencils, you know, they <laughs> weren't to be desired. But the other cool thing, what I love about this game, is that all the activities are very drenched in like Japanese culture and Asian culture, but the rule book is hilarious to me. Now this might not mean anything to you, but this is hilarious because this looks exactly like the cover of a Japanese student or a Taiwanese student's uh, homework book. You might think to yourself, well, how do these kids memorize all these characters? 
and how to write them. Well, that's because their teachers said that's all of them. Like, your homework is to write this character, you know, 100 times. And they have to write it 100 times. And think about the teacher who has to look at each individual student's character 500 times. But that's the rule book. And I think that's really, really cool. Like, it's, it's that actually a little step that makes the game great. Uh, there are different versions of this. There's the Japanese version. There's the mainland uh, Chinese version, which I have. There's also a pirated version, you know, but that, hey, you know, that, that's what happens. Now, this, um, the original Japanese version has two player sheets. This is their monthly calendar. This is uh, your secret information where you keep your homework and the hearts that you give to other players. Uh, the Taiwanese version comes with these colored uh, sheets, and uh, they have different colors. So in the box, they have like different colors, like orange, blue, red. So it's a little bit more colorful there. They put both sheets together, and then you just have to <gasps> tear them apart, and then you can hide it underneath. Also, they made the homework uh, a cute little hopscotch as opposed to just a straight line. Little details like that, like really, really add a lot to the game. How do you get this game? Well. You could go on Amazon JP and see if you could find it there. Uh, I would recommend that you just get the Chinese uh, version, the Taiwanese version, because that'll be a little bit easier to find. And you just go to the publisher's website and you should be able to find a copy of it. It will all be in Chinese, unfortunately, but thankfully, uh, someone posted on uh, BGG a complete translation of all the cards, uh, as well as all the player sheets. So everything you need to know how to play the game is on BGG and I would recommend definitely checking it out. I think it's definitely worth it. Not only is it a good fun gaming experience but you get to learn a little bit more about Asian culture while you're there. And that to me is the best roll and write game from Asia. And that has been my top 10 roll and writes from Asia. Did I miss anything? Do you disagree with me? Comment below and let me know. Let me know what other wonderful like, games from Asia that I could find. If you like what you see here and you want to see more, uh, like, subscribe, hit that bell icon, and consider, for the price of a cup of coffee every month, uh, joining a Patreon, and you can really help me out finding more of these gems and playing them, getting them to the table, and letting you know about them. Once again, my name's Jay. I play Asian board games. Just reminding you guys, stay safe, stay strong out there, and keep gaming. Thanks for watching.